Welcome everybody, in this video we're going to take a look at an example of an immutable list. For those of you who know what they're looking for, go ahead and skip to the theory. For those of you who are just curious and you're like, oh, what the heck is an immutable list? Well, it is a data structure and you should care because data structures and algorithms are core principles of programming. So much so that you have uh, specific modules dedicated to them in university. So if you haven't taken a computer science degree, look no further. Uh, this will be your university. I am going to give you two pointers on what to look for if you're going to be completely confused. This immutable data structure is going to have some specific problems that are solved in unique ways that are going to basically allow you to think a different way. So you're going to have more perspectives on different problems and that will just make you a better programmer. It's always nice to have more tools in your toolkit to solve problems. Okay, so without rambling for too long, let's go ahead and get to the drawing board and we're going to start from the beginning. We have our humble array and generally in C sharp, when you create a new list, it will have an array internally, right? So just a zero, one, two, and so on and so forth. The internal array is going to start at length 32 or something like that. As you're adding more and more elements, it will copy the array, resize it, and then it also uses object pooling underneath that to basically make it more efficient. Now, using the arrays in this way isn't truly a dynamic data structure, so you're not always occupying just the exact amount of space you need. You're always sort of recreating a buffer that once you come up to the end of it, there's a little bit of downtime to allocate an even bigger space. So this is where long, long time ago, I don't know who it was, but basically uh, people came up with a pair, a special structure that can essentially contain two values, right? So for example, it can store a zero and one, or what it could do is store some kind of value and then, well, point to another pair. And that could uh, store some values. With the use of these pairs, you can essentially arrive at something called a linked list. These are also sometimes referred to as nodes. So you'd have the first element that would point to the second element. This would contain one and this would point to the third element and this would contain two, and then there's a null reference here, so we don't point at anything. And there we go, a list that can grow and reduce, and if you wanna, well, replace a node, you just replace this node here, and all is fine and dandy. So now you have this data structure that grows and subtracts as you're adding and removing nodes from it. At this point, if you're confused, go ahead and look up linked lists, pause the video here, and go look at an example implementation, but you can consider this to be essentially a class with two properties. One property is the value that you want to hold and the second property is the next node or the next pair, okay? If we would simply take this uh, linked list implementation and we, and we would try to make it immutable, we would do something like this, okay? First, we have a node with just one element, so we will have a variable and I'll just call this a list one and it will point here. If I want to add something to it, I'll just flat out go ahead and copy the first element, go ahead and add the next element, which is going to be one, and then list two is going to still point to the beginning, and then so on and so forth. So hopefully here you can imagine that the more elements we have in the collection, the more we're copying and the more we're duplicating data, which isn't exactly efficient. Okay, what can we do about this? Well, uh, some smart people came around and basically said, okay, if you have this first element, you have this variable one and it points here, you can have the second list point to this node here. If I'll split it, uh, I know I'm gonna draw the numbers on, uh, like, let's say wrong sides or whatever, but basically you'd have something like this. You'd have list one starting here and then list two starting from the end and pointing this way and then you'd have list three and these occur every single time you basically call dot add method right so you would have your add on the method and on a regular i list or list structure add is a void in an immutable data structure add would return a collection of itself right so it would leave 
the collection alone, but it would return a new collection with the value that you wanted to add. And then you'd have your list three pointing over here. This would be two, and this would point over here and so on and so forth. So here we're gonna draw this dotted line, which is gonna basically just travel that way. The problem that happens with this implementation is if we wanna come around and say, okay, let's replace the second element with something like this. And I'll place 11 here just for an example. Uh, we cannot do this. I'm gonna select red arrows for this. Uh, you cannot have a node point to two places so what would happen if you'd want to replace this specific node you'd have to let me take black here again this arrow wouldn't exist this would just point to over here and then you have to copy the rest of the chain so all of this would get copied and so on and so forth so you aren't exactly performing a copy every single time as you're doing in this example you are, however, needing to perform this copy if you're going to insert. If you're just adding and appending towards the end, this is completely sound. This is as good as it gets. You reuse the rest of the collection and you're just putting things on the end. But as soon as you want to actually insert something into the list, this is where one side of the list will have to get copied. Okay, so all of that will have to be a copy. And then uh, even uh, smarter people came about and uh, what you'd essentially end up with is let's say we start with the uh, first node where we just have a zero and if you want to go ahead and add one more value well right now we say we don't care okay you can make the value just point over there it doesn't really matter we can just copy the value as well and do something like this and let me just mark these so we know where the story is in terms of like addition, right? So if we call this add method over here, in between these two, we would call the add method again. And each one of these is its own list. So imagine there is a container around this structure that I'm going to draw. If we want to add the next value, this is what would happen. We would have a zero, a one, and then an additional node here, two, and this would be blocked off and to join these there would be essentially what's called a path node that joins them together and by the way uh, we can say that these are variables pointing to these objects this would be pointing right over here if we would then want our fourth variable and the addition of three what we would do is we would copy this node place the two over here three over here and then create a new root. So we're duplicating the path. And this would just point over there. And this would point over here. What is being used here is essentially a tree data structure or a binary tree data structure. If you're unfamiliar with those, or again, if you're feeling a little bit confused, go ahead, find an example of a tree data structure and then have a go at implementing it. Let me reshuffle things a little bit. If we would then want our fifth object, so we're adding number four into here, fifth object, each path node can only point to two value nodes. So we would create a node here. This would hold the value four. We would create a connector node. So we're kind of mirroring the structure over here. And this would just point over here. And number five would point to this path node. And this path node would point here and here and now i'm going to perform an insert operation in this specific node by inserting 11 what's going to happen is we will copy this i'll place 11 here and zero will be kept again uh, it is not that significant this could be a reference over here but we will just copy this value for the sake of it we will then provide an additional node which is going to point over here and this arrow maybe for it to stand out a little bit more i'll just draw it as a pink arrow will point right over here and i'll continue drawing these as pink actually we will then replace this node we're just essentially copying everything on this level and this would point all the way over there like that and then our sixth variable is pointing over here this may look a little bit messy but this provides an optimal balance of reusing values when you're adding and when you're inserting or replacing values inside your list. 
This also being a tree data structure may invoke some questions that are essentially like, let's say I want to pick something at index number two. Where the heck is the index number two? Okay. So we will go ahead and now talk about how indexes are calculated in this structure. So we have something like this, right? All the values are at the bottom. And if you do notice at the beginning, we start with only one node and it is growing that way. And that is going to be, well, uh, a little bit maybe strange to implement, but you will see how that works. The way that you find your index is, let's say we want something at index zero. And let me just draw a line over here. We'll have the next index one, index two, index three, and uh, let's say four, five, and six. So the bit which represent a zero looks something like this, right? Zero, 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 zero. Uh, one will be one, zero, zero, and then so on and so forth. And then zero, one, zero, la, 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 one, one, zero. Uh, I am all out of sound effects for drawing these. Uh, hopefully you get the picture. We mark the left side as zero and the right side as one. Left side as zero, right side as one, left side as zero, right side as one. So we can see that zero, 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 we arrive at index zero. Uh, for one, zero, zero, we cannot go one, zero, zero. We would arrive at E. We want to arrive at B, okay, right over here. So when we are traveling this way, we would go like this. So we want to, in fact, travel this way. And this is where we need to consider this length because an integer in C sharp is essentially four bytes length. So it's going to be pretty big. It's essentially 32 bits, 32 of these guys. So we need to be starting somewhere over here and saying uh, we want to go this way. And this is where if this is position zero, this is position one, this is position three. We want to be considering these at these levels. OK, so the depth here or level, whatever you want to call it to represent this. So we will be basically drawing a line that goes something like this. And depending at which level we are, if we are here, we will be considering the zeroth index, depending on where we are. OK, but if we would want to go to five, this would be one, zero, one. Remember, we're going this way. So one, zero, one, which is over here. And we would get F. So this is about all there is to the theory of uh, immutable lists. I do recommend give it a pause here. Try implement this yourself. See where you get to Google research. Try to do something. If you fail, go ahead, continue. See how I implement one function and then maybe see how you would implement the next function. Now we'll take a look at the implementation. As I've mentioned before with the drawing, uh, do imagine that there is a structure around this which hides all this node malarkey. And that's essentially where we will start. We will start with adding and then once we actually have the internal structure, we will try to get some elements and then we'll proceed to insertion. Let's create our humble class, which is going to be the immutable list. And this list will be able, just like any other list, to store anything at once. We will then add a method to it, which will say public void add. So uh, really trying to stay as close to the, uh, what's it called, not menu, <laughs> to the list implementation as possible, and then slowly crossing the border into the immutable land. Uh, we will accept a value. So we're trying to add a value and the immutable list, when it adds a value, it wants to return itself. The reason it returns itself is because we're not adding a value to ourselves. We're creating a copy of ourselves with the additional value. So we're always extending. We're always growing from the beginning. We are going to start with a list that is empty. So a new immutable list. And let's go ahead and store a string inside of there. We want to do something along the lines of adding a and we'll go through a bunch of alphabet letters to basically solve this problem. From the beginning, when the collection is empty, we are in this situation here where we want this node or pair, but we don't have it yet. Let's create a public class node and this node is going to hold the same value. 
And now we will replicate this node structure inside our list. So this should be private. However, I'm going to create it as public. So when we actually use the dump method to take a look at the immutable list, we can see the structure be reflected in this window here. And by the way, I'm using linkpad. Linkpad has a dump method, which will just render things nicely to here. And this is why we're doing it here because of the visualization features. If I would be doing this in the debugger, you'd lose your head. Okay. Uh, we want the node of some generic type, and this is going to be root. So this is the beginning. This is where we start, right? So when we point to do something, we're always pointing to the root. And at the beginning, as we have a count of zero and count, another thing the list would definitely need something that cannot be set from the outside. So let's make this private setter. If count is zero or root is null, this is the time for us to really initialize root. If count is zero, let's go ahead and just return a new immutable list of T and we will place a value in there. But we essentially want to initialize the root at this point as well. So we will create a private constructor for immutable list. And this will accept a node T parameter. And this will be root. And this is how we are going to set our root. And we will remove the setter on here so it cannot be changed from the outside. We will also add a default constructor so we can actually initialize it from the outside. When we create this immutable list, this is where we want to supply a new root. So a new node of T. And this should start storing values from the beginning. Uh, the value because there is going to be zero uh, index as zero and one here, we want to store in the zero. And I'm going to be referring to these sides as left and right. Hopefully shouldn't come as a surprise. I'm not going to be naming them a zero and one. We have two types of nodes and to not make this a little bit complicated than it needs to be, I'm going to use or repurpose the same node for both of the scenarios or both roles. So having a left and right side, we're going to create a property where we're going to hold T and this is going to be a left value and this is going to be right value. We can initialize this through a constructor. And there we go, uh, shouldn't be able to change this. So once the node is created, it is immutable. So when we come around to creating the first root, the value goes into the left node. And because T is not a class, uh, if I try to put a null here, it's going to struggle a little bit. So I just put a default and we recreate the immutable list with uh, a count of one. So we should be incrementing the count. This is where once I create or recreate the immutable list, I'm actually going to pass the count as well. So we can go ahead and assign the count from the beginning. The count is going to be one. We will return null here. And now you can have a look at how this is going to look when we inspect this. So list one, there we go. This is what it's going to look like. And I'm not covering this. Let me make sure I remember the key bind. And yeah, I placed myself over here because uh, otherwise if I'm at the bottom, I'm going to be covering the bottom stuff. I thought this was going to be the optimal position. So here we are. Let's go further by creating. Let me actually remove that. We'll do L2 and we will be adding this to list one. And remember, uh, we have our original list where after all of the additions, the original list remains with uh, count zero and L1 is the new list. OK, so with the second approach uh, here, it's not going to be as simple as just creating a new immutable list. Once we actually have a count uh, at that point, we also have the root. We don't know what the root is, but this should look something along the lines of root add value. We want to push this value into the root and the root should figure out, do I put it in the right hand side or do I need to put it down to further nodes? One of those nodes again, will figure out where to place it. We don't have this method yet. So let's go ahead and create it. I'm just going to copy this over here, place it over here. And instead of immutable list, we're going to return a node. This is still going to be add. We don't have a count. And this is where we might be tempted to do something along the lines of check if a left value is present, put it in the right. But that's not the correct way. Remember that when we talked about which index do we want to place at, 
if we are at count of one, we want to be placing it at index uh, count one, not at index zero, which is the first element. Furthermore, when we do the addition, we want to be recreating the node with the values, right? So we're going from here to here. So what we really need to figure out is this structure on this side. How do we get the individual bits for an integer? And this is where if we come back around here, there is a structure that we will briefly touch on. I'll just return null here so we can compile. And I'm going to return a new immutable list here with a new root. So instead of this node, because root add will perform that addition. And then we will just increment the count by one. I remove this last semicolon. And uh, what we're going to quickly exercise here is really an introduction to the bit array. Uh, the bit array, you can give it an array of integers. And uh, let's say we give it an index of one. And it is going to give us Boolean values, where falses represent zeros and trues represent ones. Each of these values is an individual bit. So the bit array is the way that we are going to discover whereabouts are we in this path, how far away we need to travel, etc, or which value to pick or where to insert it. So we're going to take this bit array, we're going to cut it. And first of all, where we're going to use it is we're going to use it here to determine the depth. Let's go ahead and hide the results. We will place the bit array over here, it looks like I copied nothing. So I have no problem typing it out one more time. This is going to be an integer array. And I want to be placing it at the count index. Okay, so if I have one element, one is the index where I want to place it. So this is going to be the path. And the problem that I'm trying to solve is I'm going to try to figure out uh, where is this position that I'm starting from or that I should be starting from. And this is again, when we talked about uh, the concept of depths. So this is where I'm going to start introducing a depth as well. And I'm going to keep the depth count on the uh, immutable list itself. So on the structure, when we create our first initial immutable list, the depth is zero. So let's go ahead and introduce this depth parameter. And this can be a field. So let's just go ahead, copy this. This is going to be underscore depth, current depth, etc. And let's just set it here. This doesn't need to be a property. Just put a semicolon here, take the properties and actually place them where they belong. Uh, depth can be private. And when we initialize, we're at depth zero. So as soon as we extend, the depth is going to change to one. And uh, really, as we grow up, the depth is incrementing. So when we return the immutable list, we need to think about is the depth going to increment here or not. And really, the first time it increments is when we do this step over here, you will see that the first true flag will start at position uh, one. So this is our indicator, the first true flag that we encounter from starting from the end is our depth index. So hopefully that makes sense. If I bring up the result first, if we go from bottom up, the first true flag is our depth. So let's go ahead and calculate the depth from the beginning depth will be zero, we will then for each or actually I will want a for loop, we will start at path or actually let's name these bits bits dot length and we're starting from the end. And then we want to make sure that we are not crossing zero. So while we are bigger or more than zero, and then we're going from the end down, if bits get so we're getting an element at I, the first time that is set to true, that is our current depth. So let's go ahead, set the depth to the index here. And we can break here, or we can create a private static function that returns an integer and get depth gets the depth out of a bit array. So these are our bits, we'll place the for loop here. And we can just return I and then return zero here, depth becomes a get depth. And we'll pass the bits into there. And if we're trying to add C to this block, and we're going from this structure to this structure, 
because we would get count of bit array, this will give us a depth of one. But at the time of trying to add it to this structure, depth will be zero. So if the internal depth is less than depth, this is where I will just return null for now. But at this point, we want to extend the root. We just want to place whatever we had on the left hand side and start adding things to the right hand side. But at the beginning, as we're just dealing with this node and we're placing a value here, we do not need to yet increment the depth. So we just pass it on. Let's come back around to our add method. The add method over here really needs to know about this path to basically say, okay, uh, the current depth that I'm looking at, is it zero? Is it one? Do I need to add it to the left node or right node? Do I need to traverse to the left or to the right? So it needs to know these things. So we will pass the bit array into here, and this is going to be the path. And then we're also going to put the depth into here. So integer depth. If we happen to find ourselves at depth zero, uh, that is where all the value nodes are, right? So on depth zero, we want to take a look at the depth index of the path and see, do we need to add to the left or to the right? Let's come back to the code and we will essentially be getting the insertion index. So this is a flag for left or right and path depth. Okay. Now a question may come around, what the heck do we actually want to return here? And let me put some space here so I can actually put this in the middle of the screen. We want to really return a new node. Remember, we are going from here to here. These are separate nodes. So let's return a new node. Depending on what flag it is, we will want to return different nodes. So let's say if path flag, this is going to return a Boolean. If this is true, this is going to be an addition on the right hand side. We will return a new node where on the left hand side, we place the current value. Right hand side goes the new value. And otherwise, if it's set to false, we want to be placing on the left hand side. So let's go ahead, place the value here. And then we supply the default to the other side. We'll remove the flag. And there we have it. Let's come back around to the top. We will have L2 here. Let's go ahead and dump it. I will be adding B. Let's run this. And actually a valid error. I didn't supply the path nor the depth to this add method. So let's go ahead and place the bits here as the path and then our depth over here. We'll run this and we'll see that we are creating a new node here because uh, notice that I'm dumping after I do all the additions and the lists are being retained with whatever values they had at that time. Let's go ahead and discard this initial list because we are quite confident that that is going to be uh, remaining as empty. And this is a pivotal point where we are getting L3 over here and that is going to need an extension. When we come around here, uh, let me drop this down and the depth is going to be increasing. Let's go ahead and dump the bits here so we can take a look at them. You will see that we're entering here and the true flag is at a greater depth than the current depth. So if I put this somewhere here and let's say I will two string this so we can see the depth here. So the depth is zero, which would be this index and this is depth one. So we want to recreate or move the current root to the left, recreate the new root and start putting things on the right. Let's do exactly that. And by the way, if you're curious at the result, because we enter the if statement, we're returning null. So just as we said, let's go ahead, copy this line here. We will return a new immutable list. This root is no longer going to be the root that we want. We want a new root. Let's go ahead, copy it, place it over here. And instead of values, we want to put a path or the next node, right? So if we have this situation here, this isn't pointing to values, this is pointing to another node. So we essentially want to do this, we want to take this root, that's not where we're adding, we're placing this over there. And then we want to create a new node, place it over here. So we essentially want a constructor with two nodes. 
let's go ahead and do that and we'll create it right so node t place this here and here here we are instantiating left node and right node as well let's go ahead and replace these and there we have it so when we go around to creating this new root let's go ahead and just extend this a little bit i will get rid of the semicolon depth will be set to a new depth count is still incrementing and the root will be set to this new node and i can actually remove this type that we are adding here and let's format this a little bit so it's a little bit more pleasant to the eye just a note what i've done here is i've just stupidly gone ahead and placed a node that looks something like this when we come around to adding the fifth value uh, notice that i cannot just create a node like this i will need to create a node like this but the point is that whatever structure i will recreate here uh, there is going to be a node like this on the end of it which is going to be on the left hand side most okay so just off the get-go, I'm actually going to resolve this situation straight away where based on the depth, I'm going to recreate the structure for the needed depth. And this will look something like this. I'll create another private static. This will give me a node T where I'll just call this off. Or let's say node off some kind of value and then a depth. If depth is a zero. We will just return the thing that I've created here. Let's go ahead and cut it. So we have an error there. So we know that we need to place that over there. I will return this default node. Otherwise, if depth is not yet at zero, we want to de decrement the depth, but we still want to create this new node where the right hand side will be null because we're utilizing a different constructor and we want to uh, recall the static function where we pass the value down and decrement the depth. And this will recreate us the whole structure. So when we come back around here, let's go ahead and say node off the value that we're trying to add and the previous depth. Because uh, do note, we're creating this new node and the depth that there will be minus one, which is our current underscore depth. Uh, let's rerun this after adding all of that and see what we get. And we have A, B and C. If we then go further and go to L3, and then L4, A, B, C, D. We will stop printing L1 and we'll start printing L4. This is where if we run this at the end, we will uh, end up with a null because if we look in the node structure at the end, we return null here because we don't try to look at any of the paths, neither to the left, neither to the right. We just try to add the value. So this is where we need to put a little bit of logic to say, Okay, what's the current path if the depth is not a zero? Is it a right? Is it left? Which way do we want to go? So let's start building out the logic. Uh, we will take a similar path. We will say if path is true at this current depth, we want to go to the right. Uh, what we might encounter is that the right node is null. Let's format this in a little bit. If the right node is indeed null, we will be in this similar situation where potentially if we're like 10 levels up and we need to add something on the right, we will need this off method that we have here to basically place a node and then the whole other structure on the side of it. So let's come back around here, take this off method. We'll put it back on the node over here. Uh, we'll just say it like this. This will be public. Well, we'll do this and let me actually hide that panel. We will do, we'll do node t dot off here. We'll go back to the bottom. Right over here, we will recreate the node. We're going to preserve whatever left node we have and we're going to create a new node off with this specific value. And then we're just going to append the depth minus one semicolon here if we do have the right node we can again just recreate the node preserve the left node and on the right node uh, this is where we're using recursion go ahead and add the value and then at some point we're just going to reach zero and it will add it so let's go ahead place value path and depth and when we place the depth it will be minus one so we're going down 
Similar situation can occur on the left hand side. We might be going left and there is no left node. Well, if there is no left node, there is definitely no right node because as we are adding stuff, the right stuff is going to be missing. So we will just do the same thing that as we've done here. And then the right node will be null. If we do have the left node, that is where we want to call add. And again, just to reiterate, we're always sort of when we're adding, we're always going left hand side first. So it's always sort of like this. So right side only exists after the left hand side does. So at this point, there won't be anything here, we can just go ahead and pass the right node, but that's going to be a null as well. And for these values, we just repass what we have here. And there we have it. Let's go ahead, uh, come back around to the top, rerun this. So A, B, we then add C, and then we add D. Okay. So what about if we add A, B, C, D, E, we're adding this to L4, this will be L5, we'll remove L2. And uh, actually, uh, let's uh, leave it L4 and L5. We will rerun this. So we have A, B, C, D. And then you see how this gets nested further down, we remain at the same nesting level, and this gets placed on the same depth of zero, where this original node is depth two at this point, the count is also being incremented. So at this point, the addition is, I'd say, pretty reliable. Now, let's go ahead and create an alphabet or just a bunch of characters which we can follow. So we know that we can fill up this list and then iterate through it and maybe reverse it and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and say alphabet and I'll just cut the video here or whatever. And there we have it, uh, the alphabet, we will then uh, append this all to the list. So for each uh, letter in alphabet, we are going to reassign the list and we're just going to add the letter L to string, uh, semicolon on the end, we can dump the list at this point and actually see what it looks like. And there we go. So didn't take uh, longer than four microseconds. But uh, we now have a list with 36 elements, and it's fully dynamic and immutable. So do note that we are recreating this list with reusing some of the other nodes. So every time we push uh, in this direction, we are reusing this whole uh, side section when we're adding stuff. Now, I will create a for loop, we will start at the beginning and we will go up to the count of the list. We want to go ahead and get, we don't have this yet, but we want to get an index and dump it. If you're wondering about this type of syntax, I'm not going to do it because it's a little bit more code. And I don't want to do that. I'll just get a method because I think everybody understands uh, the get method. Okay. So we will get keep the get depth function over here, we will create a public, we're returning t get at some kind of index, we can give this a full name of index. As before, we were figuring out the latest index from the count, we can now actually figure out the path from the index itself, just like that. And that is going to give us the path, we already have the depth. So we know whereabouts we're starting from in this scenario. So we would be starting somewhere from here and going that way. With this information, let's go down to the node and we're just going to grab something similar to this and placing it over here. We'll rename it to get. We don't want the value. We can scrap the index because that is going to entirely depend on the path and depth. And here we'll say if depth is zero, uh, we have reached the end. And we basically say if uh, depth, uh, this will be the right value, otherwise, it will be the left value. Okay, so if it's true, it's one, it's right. If it's false, it's zero, it's left. Instead of the node, we are just returning the t. And if we're not at the correct depth, uh, we want to be able to return at a particular node, but we are selecting either the right node or the left uh, node. And we want to keep invoking the 
get function if at some point this is null i'm not going to put the null checks in here it's essentially an index out of bound exception but that can also be thrown here when we check the index against the count okay otherwise through the contract or the implementation we can assume that this is always going to work so we're not going to put additional checks in here so let's go ahead replace the path and decrement the depth by one okay uh, there we have it that looks like it's working all we have to do here is just a return uh, the root get uh, we're not going to be passing the index because we're essentially converting the index into these bits and we are just going to pass the depth here okay let's go ahead and see what this yields uh, we are going to print this out and there we go a b c d a f g x y z blah, 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 blah. We're able to fill this complicated structure as well as extract values from it. Let's go ahead and implement a replace. We'll hide this and uh, assuming that this is now working, we will just uh, recreate it for each loop. We will then call the replace or sorry, uh, this will be on our list here. We are calling a reverse. So we're going to reverse uh, the alphabet and we're just going to replace the whole list uh, each individual value one by one because we we know the sizes here match so for the list again we will have to keep reassigning things because we are constantly recreating the list and we will also have to keep an index so var j equals uh, zero here and j will be incremented and we'll be replacing something at a specific index i oh, actually can put the incrementation over here we don't have this yet so let's go ahead and generate replace that is probably gonna give me a wrong implementation or oh, actually that's pretty good so string t this is a value and the integer this is going to be the index at which to place this uh, this is not adding anything new this so we will not need to be checking the depth or anything like that we do want to get the path at which we're placing so we will need to grab our bits and let's actually grab this method we'll place it above here and instead of internal we will make it public same as the other methods when we're consuming the bits we will need to rely on the depth uh, however this time we're not just getting stuff from the root uh, we will be again mutating the immutable list or sorry immu <laughs> recreating the immutable list the point of the immutable list is that we cannot recre uh, recreate it so uh, when we recreate it depth is the same count is the same and the only thing that's different will be the root so the root will be replacing itself okay and it will be replacing this value at uh, this path uh, starting from this depth okay uh, these will be the parameters uh, let's go ahead and generate this method so generate method uh, place a comma on the end and um, yeah hopefully i'm not sure if it's generated a bunch of replace methods for me but okay there we go so let's move this up again we will put it actually let's put it before get because it's closer to the mutation code uh this will be public uh t here t comes from the node class so we don't need it here what happens in here is very similar to this structure here of addition so let's copy it place it over here instead of bits we will use path node string will have to be returning node t and let's go through this one by one we will not need to change many things but again uh, when we're replacing or getting stuff we can assert that the elements are going to be present based on the count right so if somebody requests an index that's past the count we don't have that okay so we can throw early before ent entering the node structure uh, when we're getting the value we should always retain the right value because where we might be inserting over here which is exactly what we did and we want to retain this left value or we might be inserting over here and we want to retain the right value so if we are inserting on the right this is correct if we're inserting on the left we want to preserve the right value of the current node and that's pretty much it for the insertion in terms of again correctness uh, right node being null and left node being null should never happen because we've added to that place so that place should exist we can rethrow exceptions here although again the situation just shouldn't occur if we're going to the right we are calling a replace on the right node if we're going to the left we're calling a replace on the left node and 
this looks good to me. Let's go ahead back up here, re-review -re the code that we're reversing and replacing all of these letters. We'll play it, uh, forget the semicolon here. Let's play it again. And so much uh, for this uh, situation not being able to occur, uh, it is actually occurring now. So let's first double check. We will start from the beginning of the replace and we'll make sure that uh, well, we're doing everything correctly. And uh, uh, whoop de doo we copied uh, the bits from over there. So we're using the count. Uh, we wanna be recreating the index or sorry, the path from the index that we're doing here. So let me drag this over. And uh, this uh, doesn't look like a good error. We're getting a null reference here. Uh, I'm not sure what it could be. Let's go ahead and put a breakpoint here and we'll just run and see what is null at this point. Uh, parameter P, um, I don't know where this came from. So it looks like, yeah, some kind of code generation generated uh, some logic that we don't need to. And uh, let's just try without that. So I will stop and okay, code doesn't compile, cannot convert from user node T to user node string. Okay, so string and replace isn't string. Okay, replace is generic. So let's convert to T and T. Uh, and I think the moral of the story is a link pad code generation isn't very good. Okay, so let's rerun this, see if everything works. Okay, perfect. So immutable list, uh, there we have it. It will reverse the collection. So do note that these are always recreating the collection as well every single time that we're replacing a node. So if we travel somewhere down here, the left value should be nine and eight. Cool. We've implemented what we've set out to implement, which is add, replace and uh, get. Uh, there is still a possibility to implement something like remove, which I will leave it up to you. Can't be doing everything myself. Uh, one thing that we're still going to step through is a refactoring process because we have an additional if statement here that we potentially might not want to do. And uh, generally when you do these types of refactors where you can see we're having duplication of left value and right value, path elimination or essentially branching elimination is a powerful thing to refactor. So let's go ahead and see uh, how that happens. So public interface, and we are going to create a node or let's say an inode of specific team. And we're gonna place our familiar functions on there. So node add, we are gonna have node replace, place semicolon there, semicolon, and then finally the get. I will also actually just grab all of this so I can place the off function on the interface as well. Uh, apologize for the scrolling. Uh, we don't need public here. We can go ahead and remove the body for the get and remove the Access modifier, accidentally pressed the wrong key. Jumped to the top there. And let's put, place a semicolon here. So yeah, anytime we want to create a new node, we would use inode now. And all of these should indeed return an inode. Just like that. And like that. Now we will separate these out into their own roles. Uh, as you can see here, we have things that hold values and things that are just paths. When we are recreating a path, we want a path node. When we're storing a value, we want a value node, okay? Now let's create a value node. So value uh, node of type T, and then this implements the inode interface of type T. And let's not forget the class keyword, place it over there. And now let's just take the methods that we have here, which is add, replace, and get. We will copy all of this, place it over here. Uh, come back to the node again. We will grab the constructor for this. We'll place it here, which is just instantiating the values and we'll grab the left value and right value. We'll actually cut this and place it over here. Uh, the name of the constructor, let's rename it. And this should all return inode to satisfy the interface. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. Inode, this whole malarkey doesn't belong here. We are purely interested in this. And for path elimination, let's go ahead and remove that if statement. Uh, same thing is gonna happen here. Remove this and this format. 
same thing here remove this and this and format return inode from replace and when we're creating new ones uh, it's going to be a little bit confusing for it so we want to be creating a new value node in both of these instances uh, actually for the second one it seems to determine it quite well so uh, let's leave it at that. or actually let's uh, just point it out in all cases so there we have it one big end there okay i don't know what happened there uh, but yeah value node so this is our value node and didn't mean to scroll that much again i apologize for a lot of scrolling if you do want the source code uh, you know, support me on Patreon. Uh, once we do have the value node, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the path node. Well, we'll just take this node and rename it to path node. We will make it implement the inode T. Uh, the left and right, uh, let's remove that. For the nodes, uh, these can either be value or uh, path nodes. So we're going to be working with inodes. Uh, constructor name is a path node. Uh, left node and right node, we don't really need to call it uh, that. These can just be left and right. Uh, let's uh, place them as I nodes. The interfaces return I nodes as well. And uh, same as before, we don't have the if statement to check. Uh, do we need to go somewhere else? We are purely just checking based on the depth here. So, uh, for all right nodes, let's just place right. For all left nodes, let's just place uh, left like that. And path nodes is the thing that we want to place for the constructors. So we are recreating ourselves during these. We are recreating the path node. Similar situation in the replace. We will remove this method over here. We will be recreating a path node. We will be using left and right and then again continue with another left another right uh, this situation no longer exists here again we're using right and left and note off we don't have it here this exists on the static interface right so right over here and in the places where we were using it let's go ahead and start using the interface so node of t place it here as well and i think that is it uh, let's grab the interface. We will need to go to our I immutable and we will use the I node here as well. When we start here, this is actually a new value node. The root stores an I node like that. And I think, okay, so when we're creating a new ones of these, when we're increasing the depth, that is going to be a new path node of type T. And I think that is it. That is the refactor. So it still works as you'd expect it. Although now each individual uh, node has their roles. So you just have your interface and then you have your value node, which represents the value. And, uh, you know, you still get the add, replace, etc. And then you have the path node, which sorts out the path. Uh, I don't know about performance with regards to converting these to structs or classes. I think immutable list is good as a struct. Uh, the node structure internally, I think, should remain as classes. Although, again, I don't know. Um, the uh, Roslyn library that is using immutable list implementation, the immutable list in there is implemented as a struct. So that's the only reason I'm saying uh, this one might be better as a struct. So go ahead and explore, run benchmarks.net on this uh, if you've actually gone ahead and built all of this out. But this is all I have for you. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comments. If you would like me to do a hash map, essentially a immutable dictionary, again, uh, leave a comment, uh, leave a like. If there is enough interest in it, I will do it. As always, very big thank you to my patrons. If you do want the source code, go support me on Patreon. Your support really helps me make these videos. Thank you very much and have a good day.